hear what you just said. He doesn't want you what he hear he's yeah. saying. Um, you know, I. I mean, you couldn't interpret it. There was no, yeah. you know, like I yeah. say, he would just do it to. It would be his prayer to him and the yeah. Lord, and it was between them two only. So. Now, do I feel a person, if a person wants to have a prayer language that they've called out by themselves and God, absolutely. But if it was public, why would you not want anyone to hear what you were saying to God? Mm -hmm. you, you know, so again, um, tongues is, tongue, don't get caught up in it. A lot of people do. And one of the reasons why, why I included it here is, is to have a biblical basis. And God is a God of order. So if there's distractions or if there's, if there's garbage going on, that does not glorify God. Because God is orderly. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's why when we come to meet God, we need to be aware of that. Because we can quench the spirit. We, we, can, we can stop it because of disorder. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not saying what your grandfather did was right or wrong. I, I wasn't there. But um, I would have had... I would, you know it now. Uh, it would have said, "Hey, according to scripture, there has to be an interpretation." Mm -hmm. So, if if tongues is in pu in a public setting, it needs to be interpreted. We have in the early church of God, uh, E. E. Byron was was called. E. Byron was our our uh, second editor after D. S. Warder. E. E. Byron was called up to a, a church in Wisconsin, and it was a Scandinavian church, and he was called to preach up there. And what happened is, when he got there, his interpreter was sick. And so he didn't know what to do, so he got up there and he preached his whole sermon. And they all nodded and amen and all that. He didn't know what was going on. So when he went back home to Anderson, he got a letter and it said, well, E.E. Byron was here at one point too, but he's the one who moved us away from Moundsville. But E.E. Byron got a letter and said, we, we had no idea. You spoke perfect Scandinavian. He got up there and just spoke English and they heard in their language. So hmm. th there are there are times when God uses it is a gift. I mean, now, now we've seen that in our own lives, where we've we've said something to someone that they heard something totally different. It's what God needed them to hear. Yes, our words failed yes. us. Our yes. heart was right, and, and but what we said was good. right. But what they heard was something healing. We we've all felt that I hope in our own experience, and they thank us for something we have no idea. You preach sermons. That someone afterwards has told you what a wonderful message and how it made sense, and you didn't remember piecing any of that together. But there have been times when someone said, I, Pastor, I needed you to say this, yeah. and I think I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> That's all the but same they, thing. In, in a way, thing. yes. And, and again, what does that do? It gives God glory. It, it points to God. That's what worship is. Worship is us meeting God. But we get caught up in all the other little stuff that we miss that. And, and so remember, if, if we're focused on anything else, we are not worshiping. Period. I tell, I tell our group, I said, we just do the best we can. We have no idea what the people hear. Yeah. God takes care of that. Right, right, right. So, so. <coughs> In the church we get to when I go to Charleston, my family, their church got mission. And then when they pray, they all get around the altar or in pews, and they verbally, out loud, you hear everyone, it's like, it's just, everybody's praying, but they're speaking normal, but they pray right. out loud, everybody, that's right. the way they do it. Yeah, we did that at our, our uh, second church, uh, everyone, when during the pastoral prayer, everyone prayed out loud to God. That's chaos. And um, <laughs> I didn't like it, that's what they did, um, it was very interesting. They just they did that over here one night before we were praying, that all these people got together, it's <laughs> like... Ten different people praying ten different yeah. things at the same time. It was like yeah, a that's roar. What they do. They, they yeah. pray their own prayer and it's loud. And some of them get really boisterous, I'll tell you. Don't let yourself get bogged down in this. <laughs> Remember, worship is about meeting God. Get rid of the distractions. Meet God. Prepare, and this is one of the key ways of doing it. Day four is going to be one of the most <laughs> important days for you. Day four. Worship doesn't just happen automatically. We have to be intentional if we're going to worship. True worship is not manipulated or mustered or up or settled down. True worship sees God. But if we're going to see God, we have to have our eyes open. Now, we're living in a world where multitasking is the norm. People are talking on cell phones, they're searching the Internet, they're doing other jobs. God wants us to encounter Him, and we can't do it if we're not focused on Him. 
Worship is not multitasking. Worship is God-tasking. And so if you come in, what does the enemy do to you? Did you turn the iron off? Did you do this? What are you going to eat? And what you're doing is you're thinking about all these things. You can't worship. Now you can go through the motion. Oh, I like that song, so you jump in. But that's not really worship. That's just singing along at a concert. You see, worship is saying, I am going to meet God. I am going to focus on God. And you have to prepare yourself for that. You have to get ready to do that. Leviticus 6.10, the priest shall put on linen clothes with linen garments next to his body, remove the ashes, the burnt offering, the fires consumed on the altar take place. So what the priest had to do, and if you, if you look through Leviticus 6, it's very specific. In order to worship, the priest had to put on a whole new outfit. They had to get rid of all the ashes of the old fire. They had to put it in a specific place. Then they had to come back and they had to change outfits again so they could stand before God. So the priest had to continually, literally, physically... Get ready to dress up. And so uh, we don't have to change clothes to come into the presence of God, but do we have to change our minds? If we're upset about something, or if we're thinking about something else, if we're we're distracted, you can't worship. You you can't. Now, now you can come in and feel good. I mean, if we we all hold hands and say, you know, the days of Elijah are coming, man, I feel good. That doesn't mean I've worshipped. You see, because I may not necessarily have been, not met God. And, and so too many people think, okay, if I feel good, that's worship. That's not about it. Worship is meeting God. And so we have to prepare to do it. If, if you rush in at the last minute, if you rush in, you've got a million things on your mind, you're not going to encounter God. I'm not saying you're not going to have a good word or not have a good time. I'm not saying that you might not be blessed, but you're not going to worship. Because worship is when we're seeing God. Worship is not our own subjective interpretation. While we may prefer to worship with different styles, the end result is to meet God. And if we want to meet God, we've got to be real. We can't enter his presence with pretense or hypocrisy. We have to come before God as honestly and with willing hearts. Bless you. When we worship, it's not about personal preferences. It's connecting spiritually. John 4, 24, God is spirit. And the worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Here's another thing that we have to be prepared for. If our relationships with our brothers and sisters aren't healthy, that can negatively impact our worship. If we're not connecting with those who we can see, how can we connect with God? And if one way we can prepare to truly experience God is make sure there's no resentment or bitterness in our hearts towards others. If there's any obstacles concerning connections with others, it will impact how we connect with God. We can't worship if we're consumed by negativity. And I, I've seen people who hate each other, sat by each other, whoa, praise the Lord. No, you can't. You can't do it. Because if you can't get along with your brother, how can you get along with God? And, and so we need to understand that, that, that we need to make sure that we're not harboring any ill feelings toward anyone. If we're not, if we are harboring any ill feelings, we can't worship. Matthew 5, 23 and 24. Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar. Go and be reconciled. In other words, stop everything and go say, I've got to make things right. I've I got to get right with you. Because if our relationship is not right with people, it cannot be right with God. In 1 John, it talks about if you hate your brother, you can't love God. You can't do it. And, and so what we need to, to be prepared, we need to be honest. Boy, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that person. I'm struggling with this. We need to make sure that that we're right. We need to make sure if we need to make something right with them or if we need to search our own hearts why we have it. Because if not, it will block us. We all have many things going on. We have responsibilities, duties. It's very easy in life to get busy. And there's times when we worship, our minds will start to wander. What do I have to do after the service? Did I take care of this? And we've got so many questions going through. And what happens is we crowd out the opportunity to see God. We can't hear God if we're talking to ourselves. We can't meet God if we're looking at our calendars or our to-do lists. And so one way to prepare is to truly, truly focus on God and not concentrate. Luke 10, 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you're worried and upset about many things. And what was she missing out on? God. What was Mary doing? She was sitting there worshiping. And, and so this is why I want to encourage us is, is too many times the, the devil works overtime on church on Sunday morning. He works overtime because he wants us not to meet God. 
And sometimes he works overtime. Man, you love this song. woo You know, and we're, we're praising the Lord, you know. And, and is that a worshiper? Are we just doing a hoedown? I mean, what's, what's going on? And we can miss out on worshiping God. So don't let, don't let that really be honest. Are you really here to worship God, to meet him? A true worship experience enables us to see the bigger picture. It's not about us. Worship helps us realize how big God is, how much he's done, he's doing. Worship helps us comprehend God is better to us than we deserve and we'd be thankful. And if we're viewing worship as an obligation as a time to celebrate, we're missing out. So we can prepare to worship by counting our blessings. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, wow, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptable with reverence and awe. And so this is why I want us to, to get ready to prepare our hearts. We get to meet God. Psalms 120 through 134 are called Psalms of Ascent. And they, what they were doing is as they were walking towards Jerusalem for festivals and things, Jerusalem sits on the top of four hills, four mountains. And in pilgrimages, they journey up to Jerusalem. And in Psalms 120 through 134, they would sing those on their way. What would happen if you worshipped as you were coming to worship? What would happen if you worshiped, if you were preparing yourself before you came to the presence of God? So our worship can begin before we officially worship. And if, if we truly started worshiping before we walked in the building, we would worship. Psalms 132, verse 7, let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. And so that's why I want to encourage you, start worshiping. Start worshiping the night before. Start thinking, man, I get to come into the presence of God. I want to see God tomorrow. I'm going to experience him. I'm going to encounter him. God, you've got something for me tomorrow. You've got someone for me to minister to. You've got someone I can encourage. And when we think like that, that's when we're, we're worshiping. So we can prepare to worship by getting excited. We have the opportunity to worship. When we think about the phenomenal privilege that we have to worship an awesome God, it's breathtaking. When we're hungry and thirsty to worship God, we'll be able to worship. We can worship exactly how we seek the breath in our lungs. And, and I want to encourage you, Psalms 42, 1, it says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you. And, and this is what, if we truly, if, if we are wanting to worship, if we are seeking to have God fill us with all that we are, then that's an opportunity for us to come into his presence. So I, I have a question for you. Worship preparation doesn't just happen. We may not be able to worship if our preparation is only doing what we're doing or as we're working for, walking from our cars in the sanctuary. The more we prepare for worship, the more meaningful it will be. If, if we're running around scattered, if we've got a million things going on, do I have the right tie? Do I have a, a, a stain on my thing? Do I have, we've got all that going on. We really can't worship. You really can't. Because you're scattered. And God loves us so much that God never pushes us. God is a, is a gentleman. God, God doesn't overwhelm us. God doesn't say, listen to me. Now, sometimes he may allow situations for us to listen to him. But God does not do that. And so if we've got all these things going on, then what happens is when we come into his presence, we can miss out on his presence. I'm always amazed at, in, in worship services where I'll have, uh, I've literally had one person go through and says, the, the presence of the Lord is here. The next person said, oh, it was too hot, too cold. <laughs> what did they see? They saw the thermometer. What do you want to see? Hopefully you want to see God. Hopefully you want to encounter God. And there's some worship blockers. So day five, we've examined several aspects, but there's some things that will block us from being able to worship. Lack of preparation. If we don't get prepared to meet God, we're not going to. But also... Um, we're going to look at how we can truly prepare. Well, today we're going to look at what are some things that can squelch or can stop worship. And if any of these issues are our lives, we need to turn them over to the Lord. We need to, to, to ask Him to take care of us so we can meet Him. Now, it may sound simplistic, but if there's sin in our lives, we're not going to be able to worship or meet God. I, you can't get, can't get any closer, any, any more specific than that. Sin is separation from God. Sin is death. And so we're not able to worship God. We're only able to worship God because we have a relationship with Him. And if we have sin in our life, then we're separated from God and we can't meet Him until we ask for His forgiveness. Sin stops us from worshiping. 
Psalm 66, 18, it says, If I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Matter of fact, if we have sin in our lives, God doesn't hear any prayer except for the prayer of forgiveness. It flat says right there, God doesn't listen. If there is sin in our life, he doesn't listen. And think about it. If we're choosing not to have a relationship for him, with him, why should we be calling out to him? And so get rid of that sin. If there's anything in your heart, if there's any sin, get rid of it. Ask for his forgiveness. Ask for his mercy. Ask for his grace. And that's a huge worship blocker. Now, there's a lot of people that, that boy, oh, they look like they're praising the Lord, but that's a show, folks. You don't know what's going on inside anyone's life. They can give you the church smile. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> oh, I don't like you. <laughs> you. You know, God sees that. God knows that. Yep. And, and so if there's anything in there, folks, you can fool everyone. Woo, my preacher thinks I'm the most saved person there is. I don't care what the preacher thinks. It's what does God think. Mm -hmm. And so I would strongly encourage you, make sure, make sure you're where you should be. Another worship blocker is when we think we know it all. We think that they're all, we know everything there is to know about God. And our God's so big, we're going to spend all eternity being awed by him. This is what I love about God. The more I learn about God, the more I know I don't know. God is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every day for me. It's like, it's like man, I just saw this. Cool, Lord, thank you. Uh-oh, that means I don't know this. Oh, man, the more I get closer to you, the bigger you are. We're going to spend all eternity going, wow. People are like, well, in heaven, I'm going to play euchre all day. You're not going to worry about euchre in heaven. You're going to be in the presence of God. And, and, and so here, here we see is, is that he's that big. When we think we know more than God knows and how we know how God should do it, we're being ignorant. And I'm not saying ignorant in a mean way. Ignorant means lack of knowledge. When we're relying on our knowledge and understanding, we're not relying on God's. So if you think you've got God all figured out and, not, and you're not teachable, you're not going to be able to worship. Ephesians 4.18, they are darkened in their understanding and separate from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of hearts. Every one of us can learn something. I'll tell you who I love. I love watching little guys because they teach me so much about God. I, I, I love our, our, our youth last Sunday. I, 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 every one of us can learn something. When you have it all figured out, you're not worshiping God because then you're worshiping what your concept of God is. You're worshiping this. If we want to worship God only to satisfy our needs or wants, then we're coming to him with ulterior motives. You see, God is not a vending machine. We just put in our time in church, and now it pops out a relationship. There have been those who want God to do what only they want him to do. They want to be entertained by God. God, do this for me or do that for me. I'll go to church as, or I'll follow God as long as you give me a good feeling or as long as I get a show. Wanting to be entertained takes away from worship. Sometimes we come to church and we want to be entertained. Well, I didn't really like that sermon. pastor didn't say, woo-hoo. It's not about what the pastor says. It's about you meeting God. Well, we didn't sing my song. We didn't play that instrument. And so what we do is we want to be entertained. And when we want to be entertained, we're not really meeting God. We're just kind of feeling good. We're, we're just kind of getting our our holy heebie-jeebies and everything is wonderful. Matthew 12, 38. Some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. They were missing out that they were right in the presence of Jesus. God was right there. And what did they want? They wanted a sign. Mm -hmm. A show. And, and sometimes we want that. Sometimes we want that. Uh, um, I, I, I tell you, the, you know the song, uh, I'm coming back to the heart of worship. Uh, Chris Redmond talked about that, where there was worship war in the pastors of a church in Ohio, a very, very large church. There was a song about not singing. And what he did is he said, forgive me, Father, for I forgot what worship is. And so you know what the pastor did? <coughs> There's a church of about a thousand. The, the pastor said, we're not going to have any singing for a year. Oh, anarchy, rebellion. The church doubled in a year. And because you know what the pastor, the pastor taught them, worship has nothing to do about entertaining you. Worship has nothing to do how good you do it. Worship has to do about meeting God. That's when Chris Redman writes, I'm getting back to the heart of worship. Forgive me, Lord, for I've made the song 
Worship is more than a song. I'm giving you my heart. And so, folks, it's not about entertainment. It's about coming to Him, meeting Him. If we're not being obedient to God, we'll not be able to worship. But remember, the definition is worship is man, meaning God. We're in a relationship with God. If we're not listening to Him or being obedient, that blocks us. So dis disobedience can stand in the way of us meeting God. If you're telling God, if God's saying, I want you to go to your next door neighbor and tell him you love him, uh, and you're not saying, I ain't going to do it, he's not going to meet you. If, if God is saying, hey, I want you to do this, and you're not doing it, how is God going to meet you? You're breaking that relationship. Jonah 1.3, Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. <laughs> he went the exact opposite way. Now, how can we have a relationship with God if there's disobedience? So if we're just telling God, I ain't going to do something, then how can we meet him? Our pride can get in the way as well. Pride makes us think that we're the center of worship instead of God being the center. God is the center. Pride makes us think that everyone and everything exists for us. Worship says it's all about God. Pride causes us to focus on so much that we can't see God. And Paul, uh, pride is described as the seven deadly sins because we elevate ourselves. So pride shifts our sight of worship. Luke 11, 18, 11, the Pharisee said to himself, said, God, thank you, I'm not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, <laughs> adulterers, or even like this terrible tax collector. And what did the tax collector do? Lord, have mercy, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. And Jesus said, which one left justified? And, and see... Let's not be pride. Every one of us got something to work on. Let's not break our arms, pat ourselves on the back. Let's come and say, okay, Lord, here I am. All my good, my bad, my weaknesses, my strengths. And, and, and that's what worship is. Worship isn't saying, oh, I'm, I'm so special. Jealousy is another worship blocker. When we're jealous of others, we're making a statement, God's not taking care of us like he should. When we're jealous, we're concentrating more on what others have instead of the blessings we have from God. Jealousy is sneaky, and sometimes we can get blindsided by it. Genesis 4, 5, Cain and his offering, God did not look on with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Instead of Cain saying, Lord, I blew it, what should I bring you? What can I bring you? Then he would have been able to worship. But what did Cain do? Cain was jealous of Abel. So what does he do? He kills him. And so this is what too often we get jealous. Man, that person that's on that committee again. Oh, that person that got a new job. That person, everything is perfect for us. So what we do is we let jealousy block us. We let jealousy come in the way. Another worship blocker, and this is the ultimate one, is selfishness. We want to meet God because he owes us. We think that since we're worshiping God, he should do backflips. Well, God, I showed up on Sunday, so you owe me something. God, I'm going to throw a dollar in the offering plate, so you better bless me. That is not God. God does not depend upon us. See, when we're selfish, we're demoting God, we're promoting ourselves. We are becoming God. When we're telling God what to do, that's not God. That's our figment of imagination that we think is God. When we're making a statement that we want to control God and submit to his, his leadership, his lordship, that's selfishness. And, and selfishness is expressed brassly and, and, and also subtly. There's, there's times when the, that we can be so selfish. And if we're only looking at ourselves, we can't see God. So let's make sure we have pure hearts. Worship can be selfish. Acts 8, 19, and, and this was Simon the Sorcerer. He said, give me this ability so everyone I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. What he was doing is he was wanting to be able to pass God out. And sometimes with selfish, well, that's not the way I would do it. That's not the way I want it. That's not the way I like it. Then what we're doing is we're being selfish. And as we're being selfish, we can't meet God. We can't encounter him because it's all about us. So be very, very interested, very, very, very honest. Are these, if there's any of these worship blocks in our lives, we're hurting ourselves. So be very honest. Is there any worship blockers in your life? If there is, spend time with God. Turn that over to them. Tell, tell them, Lord, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with, with my relationship with this person. I'm struggling with jealousy of this person. I'm struggling with being selfish. I'm struggling with what I want. Be honest. 
And if we've already done that and we're still wrestling, spend more time with God. God wants to meet us. He wants us to worship. So let's not miss that mess out. God has given us a great privilege of here on earth of being able to meet him. God has allowed us to, no matter what's going on in our world, the jobs can be crazy, our families can be nutty, uh, the world is, is falling down. There was another school shooting today. It just amazes me. And, and not in a good way. And, and, and the world is falling. And we have an opportunity that where we can come and where we can focus on God. Where we can come and we can worship. But too often we allow worship blockers or too often we, we are not prepared and we're missing out. Don't miss out. Because when, when we worship God, man, there will be a peace. When we worship God, we can have joy. When, when we really worship God, it, it, it's, it's not a, a good feeling. It, it, it's a soul feeling. It's, it's, it's that which, which builds us up. It's that which gives us that foundation to stand on. Even when everything has fallen down, we're still able to stand on that. So my heart's cry for you is that you worship. And it's not about you. It's not what you want. It's about you meeting God. My, my role as a pastor is to, is to say, here's how you meet God. And how can you say that? Because God tells me to say that. And how do we know that? Because of what the Bible tells us. And so please, worship. Meet God. And as you do, it, it, makes, it makes a whole difference. Pastor, you're saying that. And we know by confirmation of other ways. I had a dentist appointment Tuesday, and a lot of what you said in, today, in this week's lesson, the dentist and I were having a conversation about and how the world's in bad shape, and we all as Christians need to come together, and we're not all Christians. We're Jews, we're Gentiles, we're all this. And he said, uh, you know, he'd like to see us all get back to um, saying prayers in, church, or in schools. Who would want to bring the gun if they're saying prayers? And you don't have to be. He, he said a little prayer so quick, and I and I went, oh, he just prayed that prayer. And he said, I never mentioned Allah or God or anything. He just said my Heavenly Father. And he goes, that goes all over the spectrum. And he said, nobody can be offended by that. And I thought about Rich Wood and his kids at school and stuff, and I said, that was so nice to hear him. And it was like I was having church with my dentist, and it was like really a, a really good day. And um, I felt like I was blessed that day talking to him. We just, I went back to work like smiling in a different way, not just because I had good teeth that day, but because <laughs> it was a good day. When people leave the sanctuary on Sunday, my heart's cry is that they don't see C.J. Plum. My heart's cry is that they have met God. And, it, you know, we're all, we're all funny, and I'm guilty of this too. When the preacher gets to the last point, what do we all do? There's a collective putting on my code, and, and just stop. Just, just, just let yourself be in the presence of God. Let yourself meet God. And, and if your mind was racing before you got there and it's racing through the service, you're not going to meet God. You're not, you can't. You can't. And so I, that's why I'm here and, and pastors are there is, is to say, folks, let's, let's quit thinking about us and, and start looking at him because that's what worship is. All right, I've kept you a little bit longer. I knew I was going on this lesson. Um, so uh, I'm going to bless you all. And, and then I want you to go bless someone else. But what do I have to say to them? I don't care what you say. Say some of the blessing. Because again, you may be here. You may be here because someone next to you needs to hear a blessing. Someone next to you needs to hear something positive. Maybe they've had a terrible day. And you don't even know. And they've got the church face on. <laughs> 
You know, he, everyone, everyone, oh, everything's perfect. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> if you've got breath in your in your lungs, you've got problems in your lives. And, and, and so maybe you just need someone just to say, hey, I love you. Hey, it's important to see. I'm glad I got to worship with you. Don't let those blockers get in the way. Please rise with me. Holy Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. We celebrate you. And, and Father, we come before you. And I ask, Lord, that... Uh, that you will allow us to experience you. Father, forgive us for the times when we've gone through the motions. Forgive us for the times when we, we've let these worship blockers get in our way. Forgive us for the times when, when we made it about us. It's not about us. It, it's about you. It's about meeting you. It's about connecting with you. And so, Holy Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you. I know they're doing a lot of work, Lord. And, and Lord, bless them, take care of them. And I ask, Lord, that, that we, we will worship, we will meet you, we will encounter you. So have your way in our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.